Okay, everybody, uh, my name is Peter Milne, and you can tell by the color of my hair that I've been in this game a long time. So today, uh, I want to talk to you about moving from anarchy to sustainability. Now, those are very philosophical uh, uh, points of view, but I'll elaborate for them for you. I'm a technology architect at Adform. Adform is a digital marketing company and uh, we build a technology that puts those annoying ads in front of you on your device or in your browser. So we'll cover today some definitions, the problem that Adform face, faces, uh, the solution that we guess is going to be the right answer, and I'll give you some ad Uncle Pete's advice at the end of this. If I can get my mouse to work. Oh, shit. I don't need an update. Can you believe this? Docker is asking me to update. All right, let's try this. Okay, so let's talk about what anarchy is. Everybody hears the word, the English word anarchy, and they feel that it is a bad thing. But an anarchy is essentially a lack of hierarchy, a lack of, a lack of defined rules because everybody knows what's right and what's wrong. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, and all startups use a form of benevolent anarchy. I have worked for three startups, two Silicon Valley and one of my own. The first startup in Silicon Valley was fantastic. It grew into being a real company. My company uh, was great. It made me some money, and it was great fun to do, and it grew into being a real company. The third one was the typical uh, Pied Piper Silicon Valley. In fact, our CTO reminded me of Ehrlich. Absolutely the persona. And it became a very mediocre company. The technology was great, but it never quite grew into being a grown-up company. Sustainability. So we know what that means from an environmental perspective. But from a business perspective, you want it to be viable indefinitely. So how could it be viable indefinitely? Your wonderful piece of technology should be useful for 20 years. So that's what I mean by viable indefinitely. Useful might be it makes money for 20 years or it enables uh, the human race in a valuable way for 20 years. Usability, okay. I want you to imagine the most useful application you've ever had. You didn't have to pay attention to how to use it. It was obvious as what you should do. And then have, think about the most terrible software you've ever used. The, it works, it does a great job, but it is so hard to do. So if you've done any language parsing, you'll know that um, something like uh, Bison or Yak are hard to use, it does a great job, but are hard to use. So usability is all about how intuitive what you have built is usable by the target audience. Okay, so I said I'm a technology architect at Adform. So let me talk about the problem that I discovered last year after just joining the company. Okay, Adform has an inconsistent user uh, experience on 88 applications. These applications define the way uh, a, an advertising campaign or an audience is constructed or the way a publisher publishes the advertisements on their website. So those business applications. So when I use the word inconsistent, that is the most euphemistic positive way to describe them. Okay, so we have 88 different applications. When I mean different, they're different. They're different like chalk and cheese, or cats and dogs, in every aspect. Uh, we have multiple sign-ons, so you sign out of one and you sign in another with another user ID and password that is approximately the same as the first one. The we use every JavaScript framework ever invented. Uh, 
which is, and some that we crafted ourselves. We have multiple JavaScript dialects. For those of you who are not JavaScript people, there are all kinds of uh, languages that sit atop the JavaScript interpreter that give it strong typing, things like that. But they're, they're all kinds of fashionable uh, alternatives. So there's no common UI components. There was no common UI components. Very little shared code or services because everybody built in a silo. Every silo was like a little startup. It got the job done really quickly. People grabbed the technology that they needed to do and magic. There was a solution to the business problem and the business prospered. And the other one we have is we have 400 plus endpoints in our API layer and they all have a unique dialect, a unique way you speak to them. So you're going to say, but REST is the way to go, but inside of REST is a, a protocol or a conversation or a dialect that you use to speak to the backend service. Okay, so what we have, uh, about a year ago, I presented this to the founders of the company. It was a career damning move was either going to be successful or I was going to be looking for a new job. And I said, well, we have this great big bag of stuff. I actually said, it's a great big bag of shit, but that's a bit too critical. Uh, we got lots and lots of features. So what would happen is they'd go, a salesman would come in and say, I have just sold this feature to this new customer. And engineering would go, okay. And then six weeks later, they would build the feature as quickly and as expediently as possible. Not as best or usable as possible. So you've got loads of features on features on features on features. And the user experience uh, was poor, is poor. But it does make money, it does work. So here's an example of four sort of areas within digital marketing. Our publishers, the application is built in Lego. Our campaigns, it's built out of a bespoke model kit that you buy on the, on the internet. Our creative is made out of cardboard that somebody did in their, their back shed. And our data management platform is done with Playmobil. All work, all are functional, but using these graphics, you can see that they are hard to integrate together. Yep. So this is the navigation map in all of our applications. It's what we used to call in the 80s spaghetti code. And everybody said, oh, no, we can't have that. Well, uh, when the web came along, we ended up with uh, this kind of a problem. So that's an actual graph that we did between things, the traversal or the navigation paths that you could go through. So I presented to our founders, we can either do business as usual, and within some years, we'll get to that limit where it's too expensive for us to add new features because we're spending all our 350 developers' resources on maintaining the features that currently exist. Or we could do something different. So we reached the crossroad. So we wanted to go from anarchy, which served the company very well, made it a lot of money, to something that we could have some sustainable and, uh, I dare I say, enterprise-style goals. So if you look at them, we wanted a consistent user experience. Why? Because it was costing us money. Salespeople would present our solution, the potential prospect would look at it and go, but I like uh, the other advertising technology solution better. And it looks nice and it feels good. It doesn't do as much, but I like it because it's nicer to use. So we were losing money in sales. So what, I, what we proposed was to have something where we have a single web page application with all of the challenges associated with that, to give it a consistent user experience, to use um, a modular components, you've heard this before, to promote reuse and velocity, and to allow us to use other UI technologies like a mobile device immediately, of course, an Alexa or Siri maybe, or uh, augmented reality or things that haven't been invented yet. Why do we do this? 
we would like this solution to run for 20 years. I'd like to die and still have it in production. I'm not being morbid. So, you've seen the problem. We had a bag of stuff. It all worked, but it was different from each other. Costly to maintain, costly to change. The solution is to have a one thing, something that's similar, something that's common. So, I presented this architecture. This architecture diagram is almost a UML component diagram, but not really. I've taken some license here and there. But the idea was to build the new user experience based on a single web page application, like a desktop, uh, to use common components. So a checkbox was always a checkbox. A text box was always a text box. A drop-down list was always a drop-down. And a um, oh, array field, a list field, was always a list field. They were always the same, so the user intuitively knew what to do. Have the notion of single sign-on. <laughs> it's harder to do than you think. You think it would be easy, but it's harder to do. Reusable problem solvers. We call them applets, and I'll talk about this in a minute. Declarative navigation. We call these workflows, and I'll talk about these in a minute. And then, on the back end, instead of having 400 APIs with their own dialect, to have a single API endpoint, a single dialect, and a modular schema that defines the, relation, the entities and the relationships between them. So none of this concept is new. Randy yesterday talked about that nothing is new. We invented it all in the 1960s, and we keep reinventing it. And Marco yesterday talked about a domain-driven design. So I've used the word entities here. It could be domain objects or the things that you know that represent the reality of the business. The other thing we've, we forced on the organization was the notion of a persona. If you're going to add this feature, if you're going to add the anti-gravity feature to a campaign, who will use it? Who takes advantage of it? So rather than saying we need an anti-gravity feature, we go to a persona and say, Bob, who is a, um, a trafficker, not drug trafficker, um, Bob, who is a trafficker, needs to have this new feature because their job will be easier. So focusing it back on who uses it rather than some salesman sold something that we didn't have. In fact, I stood up in front of the founders and said, we've got to stop selling shit that we don't have. Um, so technologies that we focused on. We chose React as the framework for the front end, the framework to run in the browser. Now, these frameworks in JavaScript are almost religions. Everybody likes them for their own reasons. Sometimes they can't express why. But our UI architect said, we're using Re React, and I went, OK because he knew what he was doing. We chose GraphQL that provided the dialect between the front end and the back end, and the technology that allowed us to create a defined schema of entities and the relationships between them, and the operations that worked on them. Uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 is the way to go for security. If you've got this Frankenstein of security model that we have, to get it to fit into that is quite difficult. So we have a few legends who work for us, gods, who uh, uh, commune with the Eternals and discovered how to do all of this. Uh, so at the API layer, we've insisted people use a standard. Today, it's Swagger 2.0. And there's a lot of leeway in Swagger. So we're trying to get them to not be so um, independent in the way they define things. So use the fields the right way around, put the right stuff in them. We uh, have a big investment in .NET, so we've been encouraging people to go to .NET Core so that we can use containers and we can orchestrate them with Kubernetes. So going from a startup where you do everything, you write the code, you put it in production, you run it in production, so you, you are the creative person who 
the architect, the designer, the carpenter, the plumber, and the toilet cleaner, uh, we're moving from that idea to being where engineers become engineers, and we have a set of professional toilet cleaners who clean the toilet for us. That's their job. So as a business solution developer, you don't write it everything. You assume that the platform has things for you. So you're going to write uh, applets and workflows, and in the back end, you're going to write what I call a schema module. It's a portion of the schema that has the functionality and the definitions associated with it. And some APIs if you want to expose them. And you're going to be a professional and unit test and integrate integration test everywhere. So the platform supplies for you one application, a single web page application. Uh, it's going to provide authentication, localization, which it does today. It's going to give you a workflow engine, a desktop in which you can plug things in, a client to talk to the back end. So you never make a REST call. You just use this client library and it does the work for you. So as a front end developer, you focus on getting the business problem solved. The back end, we're going to do the authorization stuff, the magic of OAuth 2. If you've not been baptized into that religion, it's a little involved. Um, we're going to, we provide the, the notion of a schema, uh, a mechanism for CQRS, uh, and some common services like logging and monitoring. And once again, we provide, want you as a developer to provide those tests, as an engineer to provide those tests, but we'll do the scalability and we'll give you tools to be productive. So as a business solution developer, you just focus on developing a solution. Okay, I gotta go quicker. So the single web paper application we call the one application container. So you write code that fits into spaces or places on that, just like a desktop, just like an IDE, just like a GUI, and we render them and provide the mechanisms that they would use. So from a front end perspective, we start with simple components and then we make composite components out of them using React and everybody uses the same components. They don't invent their own. Then we put them together in an applet which is a React high order component but it has the knowledge about data, so it has a knowledge about the entities that it uses and how to query them using GraphQL. And then we stitch these things together using a workflow which is essentially a finite state machine. Everybody know what a finite state machine is? That thing you studied in university that you very rarely use in real life? I'll talk about that. So what's an applet? The real world example is that uh, if you're an old person like me, you'll know about ActiveX and you'll know about Olay. And if you're really old, you'll know about shared libraries. So in Word, you can embed a Excel spreadsheet and a picture and some paragraphs and some styles. These are all little components. They are all applets within themselves. In fact, Microsoft coined the phrase in, uh, when they brought out Windows 3.0. So they're embedded in this solution. It looks to the user as if it's one solution, but it's actually small problem solvers. So a workflow, consider this workflow. On your phone, you want to send somebody, you want to email somebody a picture. So you open the email editor and you say, dear Bob, here's this cute picture of me doing something wonderful. And then you make some kind of gesture in your email application that allows you to insert a photograph. So you go to a place where you can choose the image, maybe preview the image, and say, done. In that situation, the ability to look at images and view them and select them is not built into the email application. It's in the photo app or something like that. And you have somehow connected to it and navigated back. Okay, got that concept? So that is a workflow. Remember in your phone, you've always got this little back thing, back to the place you were at before. 
So we built this concept. This is what the front end actually looks like, where you have a one application container with a few workflows that can run into it. Uh, we provide a workflow library, a middleware client that allows us to do queries, applet class library, this horrible Frankenstein that we had to build to make that happen, and the usual stuff about localization or internationalization. So what's an applet? As I said before, it's a little problem solver. All it does is this. In this case, this applet shows the schedule for a campaign. It knows how to get that schedule by doing some kind of a query, and it knows how to render it. It doesn't know who invoked it and doesn't care. So on the, on the left-hand side there, I have a little bit of an applet there. It's a little tiny one, and I'm sorry, I am not a JavaScript developer or a React person. When I saw JavaScript 18 years ago, I thought it was Satan's phlegm. So, but think of it as this little problem solver. It gets invoked with some kind of uh, context, some kind of input data. It has a positive outcome, like an OK or an affirmative choice, or it has a negative outcome, like a, a back or a cancel, kind of like a promise. So an applet itself may stimulate a GraphQL query. And why did we pick GraphQL? So on the, on the left-hand side is a GraphQL query to um, uh, look at the audit log and get some changes. You'll see that there's some parameters in there and almost some kind of structure. Check out GraphQL and you'll get the idea very quickly. But what it does is this. We have a bunch of APIs that could be called in this uh, invocation. And so instead of sending six or seven requests for information across the low pit speed part of the network, the internet, we can send one, let the back end do its job much faster, collate the results and return them. And that's uh, in the shape, the graph shape that the front end user asked for it. So if you only want the tip of the toenail of the elephant, you only get that back rather than the whole elephant, which is what you get with REST. OK, so applets are small problem solvers. We stitch them together. We glue them together with a workflow. And once again, this scenario in your mind, you want to insert the photograph, you want to choose it, you want to be done. That same style, that same conversation, we're employing throughout the whole UI design. So not only are we using common applets and common components, we're using a common philosophy on how to navigate. So if you're using the application and you've never been there before, you can kind of guess what it is. Just the way we built applications with GUIs in the 1990s. So here's an example of uh, some navigation going on in the top. And you'll notice here that I've modeled these as a state diagram. So the states are what the user sees, are what the applets do. And the transition between states is their navigation. In my whole career, using fa user facing applications have always used a state machine to navigate from one place to another. Green screens, GUIs, webs, always the way you save on your, you both your stack and your heap space, and you have control. OK, so the workflows are declarative. So you can see a simple JSON model there. It's a really simple one where I've defined a few states and essentially one transition with an implicit uh, back transition there and an initial state. It doesn't take long to realize that that's easy to build. You could build it and understand that the transitions have a name. So that's like an event being posted to some event pub sub system that stimulates the next response. So essentially, when the campaign applet generates the campaign to line item event, the state machine determines which is the next place to go to, or the workflow determines which place to go to, and then invokes that. 
Pretty simple, huh? Okay, well, what do we do with our legacy stuff? I could talk about the uh, legacy integration for a long time, but I'm running out of time. Um, if you're not familiar, the term thunk is used. So when uh, Windows NT was invented in the early 90s, uh, there was a thunk layer to allow 16-bit Windows applications to run on the 32-bit operating system. Today in Windows, there is also a thunk layer that allows 32-bit applications to run in the 64-bit uh, instance. And thunking is a technique to connect the old to the new. It's interoperability and it's bi-directional. So we also Im implemented a way to do thunking from the old sack of stuff that we have to the new environment. Why? Because we can't afford to stop doing any development for two years, redevelopment everything, and everything's beautiful. We would run out of money. And so, remember that you're, you get to play with this nice technology and have fun with all the tools because someone pays you. And someone pays you because either it's a, a public sector thing, a government thing, taxpayers pay you to do something for the whole community, or it's an enterprise being paid for some service they're offering. So they have to be profitable. Okay, back end, I'd call it access to entities. Think access to domain. So we needed a common business entity model. And this is a, a class diagram. I chose uh, UML because it's something that I know. And this uh, diagram is actually drawn with plant UML. If you hate drawing UML diagrams, You'll love plant UML. It's like code, and it does the hard work for you. This diagram would have taken, uh, I don't know, four days to draw. It took me about three hours to suck the information in and make it go. So, But the idea is that we have a common schema. We have APIs, the same API with two endpoints. On one endpoint, a campaign is a certain shape, like the status of a campaign is a string and an English word that describes the status. And in another endpoint in the same API, same microservice, a campaign is described, the status is an enumerated type of integers. So that suggests that there is a leakage of front end requirements into the back end. Okay, the English word is, is generated in the back end. And so this is mildly frustrating. So that's Uncle Pete's advice. It's not mildly frustrating, it's, it's terribly frustrating. So we want a common model. Everybody, when we talk about a line item in the buy side of the business, uh, and we talk about the same thing on the sell side of the business, it's called a placement. So for crying out loud, make them the one thing. It's exactly semantically the one thing. So to implement this schema, so that the front end has a common schema to use. We built a schema server based on GraphQL. We used the Apollo uh, JavaScript GraphQL. Why? When I first learned of GraphQL, I thought, let me try it in Scala. Scala, you know, scalable, uses uh, JVMs really well, deploys on any platform. That was my architectural principle. So I spent three weeks on it and decided that the engineers would lynch me. So I did it in Node.js and JavaScript, not knowing Node.js or JavaScript, and implementing the schema server in three days. So that's what we did. We've divided the uh, schema server up into things called schema modules. Schema modules are a portion of the schema. They're owned by an expert. So the campaign schema module is owned by the campaigns team. Like I said, we have 300 engineers, so you can imagine we have, I don't know, 80 teams. So each of them has to be an expert. They know their subject matter. And we have several kinds of those, but the concept is that each module is written by the um, individual team, owned by them, and then is pulled, oh, there's a schema definition here, that's a, an example of GraphQL there, where you define the types and the operations you do on those types and the relationships between the types. And we pull it all together in one aggregated, one composite schema 
that's presented with all of the software engineering challenges of doing that. So we have a single schema for the front end to use uh, based on familiar patterns like CQRS or read and write models. How do we make this go? All right. First of all, we have now invented a wonderful pipeline. You can see this state diagram is a linear state diagram. We use GitHub for everything, GitHub Enterprise, because we source everything inside. We use Drone CI because it's really good for containers. So you commit to GitHub with the appropriate tags or in the appropriate branch and you stimulate the pipeline. Partway through that, we want to take the container that we've generated through the um, CI and put that into Kubernetes. So we use Helm, a Helm chart, to describe the Kubernetes pod for it to run into production. And we store all our stuff. Now, I've said binary here in inverted commas. We store all our stuff in our artifactory. So things like an NPM repository or a, Maven, a private Maven repository, a new get repository, everything that we built that's going to be deployable goes into uh, artifactory. And that way it can be controlled. So containers, what do we get out of containers? Right now, Adform runs on virtual machines, gazillions of them. We have 2,500 physical servers around the world, and then, I don't know, three and a half, four thousand 4,000 virtual machines or more that sit on top of that. Insane to be wasting that computing resource. So we're looking at containers to provide the same thing as um, virtual machines. We want the isolation, we want the limiting, we want the control. And to do that, we have to use the right technologies. So we're encouraging people to move from .NET to .NET Core with the minor uncomfortability that you have in .NET Core. Some things aren't quite finished, but they, it's quite acceptable. Because we're using Node and we're using Scala, so we can put those into a container quite easily and use it effectively. Orchestration. So. In the 1990s, there was a company called Forte Software. It was a Silicon Valley startup, went from being a startup and was sold to Sun Microsystems for 500 million US dollars in 2000. It had a Kubernetes style orchestration for services that you would run on your service. So when I discovered Kubernetes, it reminded me of Forte. So on the left hand side, we have a, a Helm chart that defines things associated with creating the Kubernetes pod. So uh, the hosts that you want to talk to, um, let's see, the ports that you want to expose, policy if not present. You can also do things like uh, specify the number of instances or replicas that you want to have running, and Kubernetes will always make sure that's running. So it makes life easier. So from a, an operations point of view, DevOps provides us with Authorization or OAuth, all parts of that. So as a developer, as an engineer, you don't do it. It's done for you. Rather than having your own logging and monitoring, we have about eight of them in Adform, eight different ways to do it. We're using Elk for logging so that you can search and find stuff. And we're using Grafana to display them. Same technology, same look and feel, same dialect for the end user. I want to mention Prometheus. Prometheus is a, a, a feature or a technology that works well with Kubernetes, and it's where you can grab your own um, metrics. So you use a Prometheus library in your microservice or your endpoint, or whatever, and you configure a few things and provide a place where Kubernetes can call this, this endpoint and gather these statistics. I thought it was magic. I tried it for, um, with uh, Node.js once again. I'm not a Node guy and I'm not a JavaScript guy. It took me about an hour to set it up. And it's brilliant. OK, so I've given you some technology. I told you the problem that we've had. We had this big bag of stuff that was essentially feature on feature on feature on feature. We were a feature factory. Unsustainable. We can't go global and expect that to, to, to carry on. I would like to retire from Adform. Um, I'd like to die, and on my grave, uh, there's a, a grave marker that says, 
invented this in ad form because it was still running. No, not really, but let me talk about organizations for a minute. Okay, people are everything. Denise talked about this today. People are absolutely everything. I work with a team of engineers. None of them are stupid. None of them are lazy. They are all brilliant, but they do have um, opinions. So opinions like assholes, everybody has one, okay? They do have favorite technologies that they might uh, be passionate about. They do love to argue. So, you know, arguing with an engineer is like wrestling a pig. After a while, you realize that the pig likes it. But this is the most important thing. We as software engineers make something out of nothing, right? That means we're little gods in our community. We make something out of nothing. We are more creative than Mozart. Uh, we are more creative than Van Gogh. We are more creative than, I don't know, pick your favorite writer. I used to have favorite writers, but not so much anymore. So we do stuff that other people can't do. All of you sit at some point and stare off into the distance thinking about your code, you're doing nothing. People think you're being rude. And if you get interrupted before you take those thoughts out of the ether and write them down in code, you have to go back three hours and start again, right? Yep. In the, uh, in the 2000s, my wife uh, was in the same, I had my home office and she'd sit in the same room. And she would talk to me. And I told her gently several times, look, you can't talk to me because if you do, I lose what I'm doing and I have to start over again. And eventually there was one day and I was just at the culmination of this, you know, creating an anti-gravity machine that would give world peace and things like that. And she said something to me. And I said, I've told you and I've told you. And I th didn't throw her out, but I asked her to leave the office and shut the door. And so six hours later I came out and she said, what did I do? But we are creative. We are more creative than anybody else. You have programmer's block where you can't find the solution and you go and do the dishes or play with the kids or go for a run, go for a swim and you don't have that problem anymore. You've found the solution. Okay, avoid the superhero. All of us have been or will be the superhero on the particular project we want to go to. It feels good, but it's a risk. It's a risk to you, the superhero, and it's a risk to the job. Risk you as a superhero, if they, if they lay people off, they'll keep you and allow you to do everybody else's jobs for the same amount of money. Um, but, you know, a superhero gets pregnant, has a baby, uh, or uh, goes on a long vacation, you know, takes the last 10 years worth of vacations and takes six months off. So avoid this. Teach somebody else what you know, even if they're reluctant. Okay. We don't work for the IT industry. We work for the fashion industry. And as things change, the fashions change. So these are, this timeline is my own opinion, not heavily researched. And so every few years, we have to change our fashion. We learn stuff more than any other industry in the world. Okay. Technology is additive. So I have an example of memory here. So a long time ago, memory was just relays, mechanical relays. Then it was a mercury ripple tank where you'd set the bits as, as waves inside a long trough of mercury with a transducer at each end. Serial memory. Then Dr. Ahn Wang invented magnetic core, which lasted up until almost the early 80s. Then people built memory out of discrete flip-flops. Then TTL and CMOS static and dynamic RAM. And today we ha now have NV DIMMs, which is our RAM, where you have this RAM-like speeds with SSD-like storage. It's all additive. It's still memory. You dress it the same way. All of the knowledge you have, when you learn new, you don't replace it. You add it on top. OK. And my final slide, because we're running out of time, is that things change, okay? As software engineers, what you learnt in university 
is the smallest part of it. You will learn 30 or 40 times the, the knowledge you got out of that degree. You add to it, you'll get old like me and you'll be looking at fresh young faces like you who are going, I don't know what he's talking about. And you'll teach them all of the things that you know, except what you know will be much more than what I will experience in my life. So things change. Technologies change, tools change. In AdForm, we wanted to install GitHub Enterprise into AdForm, and we had lots of opposition because GitLab was being used. The opposition was so passionate, I think, it's Git. What difference will it make to you? There's lots of advantages. But we had opposition. Um, all I can say is uh, be a grown-up and adapt to the new tools. So accept, adapt, and retrain and you'll have a long, prosperous career, and you'll enjoy your job, and you'll have a lot of fun. You get to play with the best toys in the world. Somebody pays you to have fun. They've been paying me for a very long time, so what is it, 38 years in this game, and I'm still having fun. I still write code. There's still that, um, technical orgasm that you have when the code that was in your mind is running in front of you. Nobody else needs to know how wonderful it is to see that code running there. Yes. And you can't explain it to anybody. So that's me. Had you have any questions that I can answer really quickly before the people outside come in and lynch us? Um, like I said, there's a lot of fashions in the front end. At some point with the front end, you have to uh, focus on an architectural pattern rather than the technology. So in AdForm, there's a debate between uh, ES6 and TypeScript. And uh, if you look at the research, a strongly typed language is just a little bit more productive than a weakly typed language. And so that's the debate everybody has. So in that perspective, as an architect, as an architect, I don't care which language is used. As a software engineering manager, I might decide it would be better or more profitable or more efficient to go down to one or two languages. So, um, but to your point in front-end technology, front-end technology or user-facing applications change. In the 1980s, it became commercially viable for people to have a dialogue with the computer using a mouse. And Microsoft provided an inexpensive way to do that with Windows in 1990. Do you know why Windows is so profitable? Why it's so big, Microsoft's so big? They changed the price of Windows. When, when Windows 3 was released, they changed the price of Windows from $500 a seat to $50 a seat. And instead of everybody stealing a copy, they just bought it. So the dialogue that we got in the 90s was that you had a graphic user interface, you had a keyboard and a mouse, and you gestured with it. In your own sentences, you say, just click on this, because the click is the sound the mouse made when you, put, you pushed your finger on the button. But we use it in common English today. In the um, late 2000s, uh, the Steve Jobs of the world introduced this whole notion of touch and the gestures associated with touch. So the dialogue the user has with the device is different to clicking and typing, but the underlying architecture is somewhat similar. So the technology does change, but the underlying architecture should be sustainable. Um, so whether you program on the front end on a device in Swift or uh, Objective-C, um, or uh, if you do it in JavaScript, use something like Kony that gives you that environment, doesn't really matter. But the architecture, the way you've architected the application, does. Any other questions? Yes? We use, uh -huh. <laughs> that's an excellent question. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to classify those that way around? So we use teams. I guess they're loosely horizontal. They all have lived in silos, and over the past two years, we have change the organization to be um, uh, a little more structured. And it's hard 
Some people don't like to move from um, startup to enterprise type thinking, and they decide to leave, which is fine, because being in a startup is hilariously fun. You get to do some cool things, and it's wonderful. Uh, but you maybe once in your career go from startup to enterprise. And it's very important. And the organization of people, the management of people in projects becomes paramount. So our teams are somewhat uh, horizontal and I'm part of the architecture group and they either like me or they hate me and would like to see me fall off a cliff. Because I tell them, no, you can't do that. You have to do it this way. And then there's the argument about why and I like this technology better than that one. So. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much.